Yes, I will repeat myself. So this uh, this session is the part of our workshop that is happening in, uh, in the Department of Architecture, where I stay, uh, where I teach in collaboration with two other institutions. And uh, all the participants of the workshop actually faculty members at some school of architecture in Pakistan. So uh, they are they are coming from different 18, 18 architecture schools of Pakistan. So. Uh, it is a it is a, a not a very good number so the 23 participants not a very big number in terms of quant quantity but in terms of quality because they're all teachers they're all here uh, to discuss about the pedagogy and then i would like to um uh, tell everyone about marie uh, first of all she's a very good friend and uh, then uh, she she was my colleague i worked with her for two uh, two and a half years maybe then or maybe three years I lost the number. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, she works on uh, very interesting pedagogical methods that explores things more than typical architecture domains. And uh, that is the only thing I would say about it because Marie can explain much better. So okay. over to Marie. Over to you, Marie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your attendance. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be be so far i have never been in your country and uh, i hope once i will come uh to to see uh this uh, this incredible place of so, so incredible heritage and culture so i will be talking about multi-centered design ped pedagogy and let, let me just get to my slides um, what I am doing is research through teaching. Basically, my research, uh, which I am doing, I do that through design studio mainly. Uh, not only, but mainly. Uh, and what what we uh, what we do uh, uh, is uh, research through co-design. So we are co-designing. It's not only the studio; it's also multiple stakeholders and so on. I will get to that later. And um, what we also do is that we co-design it together with, uh, with uh, other people and place it into real life co-design laboratory. That is, uh, at, at least I call it like that. And that is something um, uh, we, we place, uh, something we co-design together, place it there, and then it's in fact co-design within the real life, because the multiple stakeholders, uh, um, human and non-human, are, uh, are uh, interacting with our um, intervention. Uh, so, so we really do physical objects. Uh, I will just get to, get to a quote to Gregory Bateson. And uh, he asked, what is the pattern that connects craft to the lobster and the orchids to primrose and all of them to me and to you? And what I'm uh, going to talk about is multi-centered design. So there is no one single center and no one single focus because everybody has different perspectives and there are different beings. And I'm I'm talking when I'm talking about different beings, I don't talk only about the humans. Uh, uh, I'm talking about cross beings co-living, which involves humans, uh, other species, artificial intelligence, or robots. Uh, so let let's just get to how do we work. So we have. Um, uh, always when we when we start, uh, that starts with humans, right? Uh, because that's the easiest way to communicate. We start with minimaps uh, uh, where every student, every stakeholder who we invite uh, map their own universe about the project. Then we connect it to Gigamap when, uh, when the, everybody starts searching the relationships uh, across the minimaps and search for synergetic uh, proposal. Then we really build it. And then we put it into the real life co-design laboratory and reflect on it and actually even redesign it. So this goes in uh, feedback loops. And uh, just to get to how do, how do I 
work with my pedagogy. I will just uh, show you my um, interactive teaching content. Uh, I have to, I have to, okay, here we are. Here we go. I introduce my students to systems thinking because that is a very important uh, field. Mm, this was actually uh, a re redesigned booklet from um, from people from Carnegie Mellon, and I I uh, used it as a background for uh, creating this uh, this uh, interactive teaching content. So I will just go fast through that uh, when you when you discuss different fields introduced to systems thinking uh, uh, and introduce some examples of diagramming uh, and uh, give some uh, give some references right uh, and give some tasks uh, then we have uh, tasks interactive tasks like this when uh, when you get to understand things and confirm that uh, this is uh, this is the thing uh, so the students uh, have to go through before uh, be until until they actually understand what what uh, matches uh, the text uh, uh, the same uh, the same here you you define what is the system what is not the system and uh, you check the answers uh, and uh, you go a little bit through the history uh, of systems thinking with the most important figures uh, in in the systems theory just uh, just going fast through it and then uh, also again my matching uh, tasks uh, for students, you know, they, they are not embarrassed because nobody marks them for that. They just play with them. And that's, uh, that's the best how the students learn because uh, they can play with that until, until they, uh, they uh, do that right and understand. Then you again uh, introduce uh, matching text, right? Uh, and uh, uh, give the task. So you give the tasks uh, with, uh, with, uh, which are matching the personal interests of the minimap of the, of the students to map their own universe about, uh, about the topic. Uh, there are some examples from previous students uh, so uh, they, can, uh, they can see how it should look. Then we get to part two, which uh, talks about uh, gigamapping. And gigamapping is about wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that are not solved by problem solving. You sort of have to muddle within the systems. Uh, you, uh, you don't solve the problem because uh, the problems are unsol unsolvable. They are too complex. So you have to, you have to sort of muddle, muddle through. And uh, then, uh, then the, uh, think is like about definition. What is the problem? The students uh, again play play with these tasks, uh, and there is uh, there is uh, the definition about the wicked, pro wicked problem, so the students understand that. And uh, then again, you discuss like they have examples. Uh, what is the time problem and wicked problem? Time problem is the one that can be uh, solved with problem solving. This wicked problem is when you have to uh, muddle, muddle through the problematic and never, never solve the, never solve the problem, right? Uh, so again, uh, placing, uh, placing different definitions. I'm not doing it right now. I'm just showing you how you uh, do that. Again, again, uh, some glossary for the students to understand the, the uh, systems thinking context. Uh, you go through and then uh, then uh, you have some uh, some definitions to understand uh, what is uh, what is the discussion so the students can read about it and then uh, then uh, discuss uh, the leverage points on Donella Meadows uh, which is uh, 
which is uh, very famous cyberneticians who defined this, uh, these things. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, again, matching, uh, matching. And uh, here you have uh, again some, um, some task to do for the students about how, do, how should they start gigamapping connecting their minimaps with the uh, within uh, the gigamaps they get uh, they get references to other examples and so on and then uh, then you have examples from from the processes uh, what uh, what has been done before right uh, and then please dance with the system so that's uh, that's the introduction to systems thinking I I developed for Cardiff University. I'm still using it. It's great that it's still online and uh, please uh, play with it. So let's let's get uh, where we get. So these are some uh, some of these examples uh, connecting uh, minimaps with gigamaps, and it is very Im important here. This uh, this. Uh, this text is uh, actually in interpretation of the of the relations, and that is uh, that is very important because uh, the students often um, like to connect uh, the things with arrow because they think I will be happy if they make an arrow, uh, which I am happy if they make an arrow, but uh, I want them to understand the relation when they make an arrow. So I, I'm always asking them to interpret the relation wherever uh, they draw an arrow. So this is, uh, this is an, uh, a very nice example of collective gigamap from, uh, from uh, the University of Cardiff, uh, where each of the students had its, its piece of cake, and you see the relationships around the around the cake. Uh, so they, they were all working uh, partly individually, but also had to, everybody had to relate to each other, which is very important uh, because it was collective project. Sometimes, uh, you know, you do that uh, in hands. These are the, the prospective students of Welsh School of Architecture that will be connecting uh, their minimaps across the gigamap and uh, propose one uh, synergetic project. So this has become a, a bit more messy when you work with communities and you have kids and whoever, uh, but it's much more fun. So uh, you, you have a little bit more work on ordering this, but uh, uh, you get uh, very relevant information. This is uh, what we do in Stuttgart when uh, when we uh, have a studio, we do that also through studio teaching, uh, and we invite multiple stakeholders where we uh, every, every student uh, presents their part of the gigamap, and in this case, we invited uh, every every stakeholder to draw their minimap, uh, mark the point in the in the presented gigamap. Uh, where is their intervention into the system? And they uh, they draw a minimap of their intervention, which was further integrated uh, within the overall design. This is something we did now, where we where we all uh, already work again in the mirror, and uh, the students uh, drew their um, giga maps in mirror, and we invited stakeholders uh, again to mark their points and started. Uh, drawing into the printed uh, giga maps from uh, miro uh, this is uh, this is uh, we, we had two groups so we are now joining them uh, together which uh, i think will be very beneficial uh, so uh, yeah and uh, this is uh, this is something we also work with uh, is bringing the prototypes uh, they are not on the previous pictures we always do that bringing the prototypes to gigamapping. Basically, we are play, placing the, giga, uh, the prototypes on, on the gigamaps and you work with the tangible objects, uh, which are very important for the stakeholders and also for the students to see the relations uh, amongst the, the tangible objects. 
So this is uh, this is uh, the prototyping part, uh, also from the Basque of architecture. I think Mamuna took this picture, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is something you know. Sometimes you do co-design workshop, nobody comes to your co-design workshop, so you just intervene into the local pub and start co-designing with the local community that is uh, that is. Uh, uh, sitting there and uh, parents are drinking beer. I believe the kids were drinking lemonades and everybody was very happy that uh, uh, we entertain their kids because they are often bored when people sit and uh, drink their beer. So uh, we had the, the great entertainment and engaged the, the local community with, uh, with our interventions. This is uh, this is already the part about prototyping. We don't use only uh, only like low tech. Uh, we uh, we use uh, digital fabrication. Sometimes uh, the prototypes are bigger. Sometimes they are smaller. Depends uh, depends on uh, on what uh, we are doing. So this is uh, this is for instance uh, work on the pavilion with the students. Uh, when uh, when we were so lucky that we got uh, the work, wood workshop uh, where we got uh, uh, all the machinery we needed to produce our work um, at uh, the uh, School of Licenses uh, in uh, Prague. Uh, uh, this uh, would be the testing of the structure. You know, you... Uh, I never believed the the simulations. We tested the structure by actually hanging me uh, down to to see that it doesn't fall down. <laughs> and that's uh, that's the best test. Uh, this is uh, this is already building, and we would intervene in the public space uh, and uh, uh, introduce the students to public engagement and. Uh, building the things in the real life co-design laboratory, which I mentioned. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what we already do in Stuttgart. In Stuttgart, we, uh, we work a bit with um, like interventions on the existing buildings because uh, our cities are built of existing buildings. We cannot turn them down. And we need to introduce biodiversity to the existing buildings. So we are building these, uh, these uh, habitats for other species uh, that are hanging on existing buildings. Uh, and uh, for the habitats, you also need uh, the edible landscape. So this is a responsive food insect hotel. And this insect hotel also have edible landscape for the insects. So they don't, they, they can have, uh, uh, functional biotope uh, and it has to be related to the bio corridors, right? We would uh, engage the community. So this is, uh, uh, we would have an opening with, uh, with the live performance uh, of, uh, of an artist that would engage the community. And this, the, these uh, performances have to relate to our prototype. So it is, it is very specific. Uh, so uh, there would be people coming to that, and they get engaged. This is uh, this is uh, the pavilion project from Prague uh, again, and this is uh, this is how we offered uh, the habitable landscape for other species. Uh, you know, it is very difficult. Like um, people in the cities typically put the needles uh, on on their windows so the birds don't sit down because uh, because uh, of the droppings right um, and then uh, then the birds don't have where to sit it is very pro big problem for the biodiversity and urban biodiversity is becoming uh, really crucial because uh, because many species are adapting for life in the cities because our agricultural land, uh, due to pesticides, herbicides, uh, and different methods in agriculture, is becoming inhabitable for them. So they are they are actually moving for the cities that offer them better conditions. But our cities are not really designed for 
biodiversity. So there is a problem. And if we need to keep biodiversity, which we need, because otherwise, uh, if uh, other species die, we die too, because, because we are completely dependent on them. So, uh, so we need to adapt our cities for biodiversity. Uh, this is uh, this is my colleague, landscape ecologist, who is uh, doing a workshop uh, with. Uh, like when we do these public interventions, we do workshops. Uh, this is uh, this is workshop with seed bombings, where, where we teach the kids how to do uh, seed bombs uh, with uh, honey blooming uh, species. And these kids are very interested. And if this this kid is interested, his uh, mom is also interested. And therefore, we engage uh, more of the community because uh, because then uh, then uh, because the parents care of their in, of the interest of their kids. And uh, there is something very important. What was in Wales, which is Future Generation Act. Uh, you see that in practice here, how this mother is looking at the, at the higher kid, right? And uh, they they take care that these honey blooming species are growing, and uh, they keep watering it because because it's an urban game, right? Uh, we would do similar events like uh, uh, teaching kids how to make uh, make. Uh, bad food for uh, for the autumn i mean in europe uh, in autumn uh, birds don't have enough food very often in at least in the city so so people are feeding the birds so we would teach how to make the mixtures uh, for for the birds uh, and we would do urban games to introduce the biodiversity topic uh, to the people uh, what we started to work at the Bell School of Architecture is uh, actually introducing the more than human economy. Uh, we work with tokenized economy that would appreciate other species. Basically, the concept is uh, like uh, we, uh, we have problem with, uh, with uh, not having enough harvest because uh, nobody pays the pollinator for pollinator. The farmer is paid for um, uh, harvesting the crop, but uh, the farmer doesn't pay the pollinator for pollinating uh, her or his crop. And it is a problem because uh, the farmer doesn't care about the pollinator. And then, uh, then we don't have enough meadows for pollinators or enough habitats for pollinator. So, so we started introducing more than human economies where other species would be uh, uh, paid for the ecosystemic performance and they could, uh, they could, for instance, buy a meadow. Or what we work with is actually introducing these prototypes that, um, uh, that offer uh, their habitats and edible landscape. And we offered the DIY recipes uh, uh, online in uh, in uh, the city gaming app, uh, uh, where we uploaded the DIY recipes, where everybody could uh, upload uh, how you can support the biodiversity, and the pollinator can uh, can buy uh, the insect hotel from you, for instance. And uh, in this moment, we did it just. Uh, by uh, by that somebody would act on behalf uh, of other species uh, i don't have uh, don't think uh, we have enough time to go to the app but uh, uh, you can scan this QR, qr code and uh, get to that it's the prototype it's not very well developed uh, hopefully hopefully we will get further but at the moment it's just prototype that uh, is like that but uh, however, we would uh, like to introduce this uh, this uh, concept to blockchain economy because the blockchain you wouldn't uh, uh, you wouldn't need somebody acting on behalf, and we would use artificial intelligence to act on behalf of other species. Uh, this is uh, this is something we always put on our prototype. We engrave the QR code that leads to our recipes. And uh, whoever goes around and is interested uh, in that uh, 
can scan the QR code, they get to the recipe and they they can reproduce the recipe themselves. So the work is uh, generative, right? Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, another QR code that leads uh, leads to the app. Uh, just to uh, get uh, get summarized, uh, uh, you know, this is a, this is a gigamap I did many years ago, and I put put a different agency within within my projects. I I some certain projects uh, being from fully open to uh, to more closed and. Uh, I summed the different agency, human and not human, biotic and abiotic, uh, and uh, this these are even uh, the like opportunistic uses within within uh, what uh, this project uh, offer, and what I got to that that what is uh, the most beneficial to everybody what is, what is having the most agency is also the most beneficial to humans so if we discuss uh, uh, non anthropocentric architecture uh, it is also anthropocentric because it is the most beneficial to humans so i would like to discuss the transition towards post anthropocene that leads to biodiversity and climate change adaptation towards multi-centered and multi-beings design. Uh, and we are all dependent on the overall ecosystem, living and non-living. Uh, for instance, uh, the river in New Zealand got the personhood, right? Uh, however, uh, recent economic models do don't reflect it. And that's why we are uh, facing uh, the mass extinction, right? Uh, so we need to adapt our economic models to in to involve uh, to involve. So I would like to discuss the transition from human centric towards non anthropocentric. That is again human centric. There is a feedback loop because what is non anthropocentric is human centric because uh, it helps the humans the most. And I would like to discuss the transition. Uh, Famous, uh, famous uh, urban uh, designer, young girl, said uh, cities for people. I would rather prefer to discuss the participation of both biotech and abiotic agency uh, within one feedback loop ecosystem, the real life co-design laboratory. And this real life co-design laboratory of my future vision should involve living ecosystem community, small collaborative robots and artificial intelligence, and blockchain regenerative economy. So thank you so much for your attention. And if you are interested in the work, please uh, follow me on ResearchGate, uh, scan this QR code uh, that leads to my ResearchGate and uh, you can uh, read multiple publications in that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amari, uh, for the lovely presentation. Um, your work is very important uh, for me because it keeps on reminding me that uh, we, we need to think more than human approach um, while designing. So that is that I wanted to share with my colleagues here, and that was the reason to invite you. So thank you very much. That, thank you. And that I would like to open the house for uh, questions. Um, uh, whoever want to ask something. Is there any questions from the audience? So maybe we can, uh, okay, I, I can uh, talk a little, uh, ask a little question about uh, giga mapping. How did you use uh, that in your own practice of uh, developing these prototypes? So you, I, I know uh, uh, you using that as a teaching tool, but then can you, uh, because I think that it wasn't uh, emphasized well enough in the presentation, the process of giga mapping, but how okay. do you use it? Okay, yes. it is it is not only in my teaching, it is also in, used in my practice, but uh, as I said, I am, uh, most of my practice is uh, actually done through studio teaching, which is uh, which is very important to mention, not always. 
but uh, but very often uh so we uh make these workshops and it very much depends uh, uh, like um uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, it's at the university uh, if you organize th those workshops uh, at the universities it you a uh, little bit struggle with attention but uh, but if you organize it in the pub uh, you know like uh, and if you get the, get the, the budget and uh, if you get the budget for booths uh, you have a security that uh, more people are coming, right? <laughs> That's how it works in Europe. That might be different, uh, different in Pakistan. But uh, if you offer catering, um, uh, more more people come because uh, because uh, they 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 think of it as a party rather than uh, rather than they have to work, right? So uh, uh, depends. We always engage uh, stakeholders. We email them. We we no notify them. Like uh, we are doing this and that project, which is uh, I mean, we target uh, different uh, different communities. So if it's uh, somebody who is really interested in or he who has the interest in uh, the area, they they typically come. Uh, not uh, not everybody always comes, uh, and it is always difficult to get the stakeholders to the to the co-designing workshops. Uh, but we work typically with the students. We bring students, and we bring um, bring uh, different stakeholders. We we uh, do a research on, of the stakeholders list. Uh, we also uh put uh, put the workshop invitations to the local cafes and uh, you know there are those uh, neighborhood up uh, here in germany it's called nebenan which uh, which is like called uh, uh, neighborhood and uh, because i am registered as living in the neighborhood uh, everybody in the neighborhood sees my sees my post uh, so uh, so we never know who is coming uh, uh but um, uh yeah i mean if if it was when we worked for the municipality for instance it was their job to invite the stakeholders we were once invited to share uh, or to co-design there was like critical area there was uh, there was like uh, uh the neighborhood with the gardens which the municipality bought and uh, wanted to make a bio corridor but uh, this uh, allotment uh, uh, allotment community didn't want to move out right uh, and they were just renting the space so there was critical conflict and uh, the municipality didn't want to make the have the conflict with them however they also cared about the, the urban connectivity for uh, for the bio corridors in the city there was a uh, very important stakeholder local schools and and if uh, like uh, when uh, when that, that was like uh, it was like real interest everybody came every representative came because they uh, they uh, kind of uh, really wanted to urge for uh, their their rights or their benefits uh, so then uh, then everybody came and it was very interesting uh, how those people who actually kind of at the beginning really hated each other and uh, didn't believe they uh, they could come to any conclusion they at the moment i asked them to make a mini map they mapped their own universe then everybody presented their uh, their own universe uh, and it generates empathy because uh, because uh, because when you understand what if if you if you just have different interests you had hate the other people because they have different interests than you but uh, if you if you understand the universe of the other people you have empathy because you start understanding uh, uh, how they feel about the situation and those people were very surprised uh, that actually they have many common interests and, and they can uh, they can work together on the common interests and de develop synergetic solution that will be beneficial for all. 
So uh, thank you so much for a detailed answer, uh, Marie. Is there any other questions from the audience? Yes, um, Mike, over there. Hello, Mary. I think I don't hear. Uh, just a second, Mary. Yes, yeah, so there's another question by uh, someone who just came here. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mary. I'm just, just Hello. Hi, Mary. Hello. Thank you for the elaborate uh, presentation. My question was, uh, why do we need to build in order uh, for the other species to come back? When we understand the biodiversity very well, why can't we uh, work on building the ecosystem in a way that they sort of uh, um, appropriate and uh, come back to their original uh, habitats? Uh, yeah, that's a that's very important question. Uh, why don't we change the agricultural systems, right? And so on. The, the problem is uh, actually like uh, the human development uh, didn't start going wrong uh, uh, just lately. It has gone wrong uh, for a long time. And uh, the other species are all the time adapting to that. So, uh, I mean, uh, before, uh, before the agriculture, there were, uh, there were uh, forests and uh, they, they had uh, different habitats. When uh, people started to do agriculture, the species adapted for the agriculture. Now, uh, now uh, the agriculture, or not now, actually it's it's many years ago the agriculture started to be inhabitable for uh, for other species so the other species started to adapt for uh, for the cities so uh, so it is it is all the problem like at this moment the only fast solution is to adapt our cities for biodiversity because because the agricultural land is already toxic it is or in many countries i and i don't know the situation in pakistan whether you have uh, small farmers and whether you have uh, enough uh, enough habitats in that i i'm not aware of the situation in pakistan but uh, most cities in europe it's a big problem because because the agriculture was transformed to in an uninhabitable land and uh, that is uh, that is what is happening now and many species have already adapted i mean it takes many years the adaptation of uh, of the species uh, takes uh, takes so many years so now the species are getting adapted uh, for uh, for living uh, living in the urban environment and we are losing the biodiversity by every step we are losing uh, more and more biodiversity. I mean, of course, there are other researchers who work with agricultural land. It's just not my field, but it is also very important. I, I definitely support that, that uh, we transform our agriculture. But uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, expertise as an architect is working uh, with an urban biodiversity because I'm an architect and I work with urban design. So that is uh, that is my field of my research, but uh, it is of course very important to change the agriculture. But uh, the importance of urban connectivity is actually not only that; um, it is also you know like there are different kind of species living in urban environment. Some species uh, actually take benefits, like uh, like uh, peregrine falcon. Uh, uh, adapted for living in the cities because they hunt pigeons, and as as pigeons have uh, have uh, uh, kind of ex extended in uh, many many urban environments, uh, uh, the peregrine falcon is actually very much benefiting from urban environment. There are species uh, that need 
uh, to pass through urban environment for mi migration because uh, many many species uh, have been uh, built on the rivers many many cities have been built on the rivers because uh, because uh, uh, human beings are also migrating people and they are also having biological needs so uh, they they build their cities on the river because they need water but other species also need water so all all the other species are migrating migrating along the river and if they cannot pass through the cities they cannot migrate so uh, that's uh, that's uh, very important that the urban environment is adapted uh, so that other species can mi migrate and uh, the urban connectivity it is like uh, it's both it's like um, bio corridor is something you don't need to eat and reproduce just pass through but uh, bio corridor is a corridor between biotopes and in biotopes you need to eat and pass through and you have to pass uh, from one to another. So bio corridor is the uh, okay space for the species to go, uh, but it has to be connected between biotopes where, where the species can eat and reproduce because otherwise they die. I hope it makes sense. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, for a very detailed answer. Is there any other questions from the audience? Okay. I think that sums it up very well. Uh, thank you so much, Marie, for your uh, presentation and for your time. Um, we will uh, keep in touch, of course, for the future. And uh, let's let's plan something where we can invite you here and we can talk more about this. Thank you. I would really love to come to Pakistan. And thank you so much for the invitation to this exciting workshop. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you so much, Marie. Uh, thank see you. you soon. See you. I will, I will Bye. I will share the recordings with you as we discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you soon. See you.